Welcome everyone to our webinar. I see we have a few attendants at this stage, so I'll wait a bit since we're expecting more than 200 people. So, so let's wait a minute and then we see uh, how registrations go. All right, let's not punish the ones who are on time. Uh, let's get started. We have 65 for 10 so far. So I propose uh, we get going. Uh, welcome everyone to our webinar on grievance mechanisms, which is a key instrument to enabling access uh, to uh, uh, remedy. Sorry. Um, it's also, of course, um, uh, one of the three core pillars of the UN guiding principles of business and human rights. Uh, and also, reflected in the OECD due diligence guidelines and not surprisingly also made it into the into the German uh, Supply Chain Act as one of the key obligations. Uh, also the European due diligence uh, legislation that is upcoming next year that also uh, uh, very much references uh, this so as one of the one of the requirements and today we'll learn a bit more about how that looks like in theory and in practice, my name is Francis Wimmer, Sacred Engagement Advisor at Amphori, and I'll run you through the session today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Just a couple of housekeeping rules. So you will all be, be muted. Uh, we have the, the, you can use the, the chat box uh, or the Q&A function to post your questions. And we'll monitor that uh, throughout the webinar. Also, of course, will be recorded and we'll also send a satisfaction survey at the end of it. So after me, it's Michaela Streibelt, again, our advisor at uh, Health Desk on Business and Human Rights. Uh, she's basically uh, been supporting us throughout the series, and she will be uh, talking about how to set up and implement effective grievance mechanisms in global value chains. Then afterwards, we have the German PST uh, and Amphori, my colleague Laura Wouters, as well as Lara Hood, uh, talking about how that looks like in practice. And then I'll give some closing remarks. So now moving on to Michaela. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, without further ado, um, I'll just uh, start with uh, telling you a little bit about the German Help Desk on Business and Human Rights. For those who don't know us yet, we're a um, government program by the uh, German government, um, funded by the uh, Ministry for Economic Development and Collaboration. And we provide free of charge advice to businesses and business associations. We also conduct training programs in companies, um, either supporting companies in designing their own training programs or um, doing in-house trainings in companies that are um, designed to fit the company's needs. So it's always tailor-made uh, trainings. We participate in events like today. We also have our own formats in different setups, for example, bringing together uh, businesses with uh, political actors, civil society actors, but we also have formats in which businesses stay uh, among each other. And we have a couple of uh, online services that uh, might be helpful, um, especially for companies outside of Germany. Um, all our um, services, including the online tools, are free of charge. Um, one is the SME Compass, uh, consisting of two components the uh, standards uh, and the due diligence compass, one being a, an online guidance in order to uh, implement a due diligence management system, the other one being a tool to help companies figure out and choose and compare between different standards. Um, our tool CSR Risk Checker is um, a great tool for the abstract risk analysis. And our tool Business and Human Rights Navigator highlights 10 uh, business and human rights issues 
and shows how um, these issues can be addressed in the context of the specific um, phase of the management process according to the UN guiding principles. And the tool also features um, yeah, practical examples from companies on how they actually address these issues. So if you haven't yet taken a look, I, I want to invite you. I believe that these tools are of great help uh, for companies in implementing due diligence obligations. But now, after this uh, short introduction of the help desk, I want to dive into the actual topic of today and I want to start with talking about what the goals and purposes are of grievance mechanisms, because they, they are twofold, basically. They can both serve as an early warning system for companies. At the same time, obviously, they're also a feedback loop in order to um, figure out how well measures are working, for example, uh, in order to make sure that um, nothing has been overlooked in the uh, risk analysis, for example. Um, but they also serve uh, potentially affected people because um, they uh, get a tool uh, with which they can access uh, companies effectively communicate with them and access remedy most importantly. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to give you a quick overview over the requirements of effective grievance mechanisms according to the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. And I will then go into more depth in relation to some of these aspects. So the um, German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act, um, maybe to, uh, yeah, to, to, to um, take a little bit more of an um, overview, um, requires companies to implement a management system. And as uh, Francis has said already, grievance mechanisms is one of the elements of this management system. On the left-hand side of the slide, you can see the other elements and you can also see, this is why I like this very, this, this little uh, symbol um, very much. You can see really well how one of each one of these elements feeds into the others and they all um, are connected to one another and influence one another. And in the center of this, um, uh, this wheel, you find um, the term due consideration of the interests of affected persons. And this is really what the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act requires companies to do. Companies must change perspective away from what, what are potential negative effects on the company and its operations towards what are potential uh, negative effects that they are creating to their surroundings, to people, to the environment. And obviously, grievance mechanisms are very key to uh, considering the interests of affected persons and making sure that these interests are uh, protected and respected. And the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act um, allows companies to either implement an internal grievance mechanism or participate in an external grievance mechanism, maybe in the context of a branch initiative. And companies can also choose uh, whether or not they set up the grievance mechanism as a procedure for amicable set settlement. This is, this is not a requirement, this is voluntary. The grievance mechanism must be accessible. You might have heard this term already in the context of the UNGP. And accessible in this context means accessible both for potentially affected persons and third parties. And what this means exactly on what companies have to do to make it access accessible and to whom and what efforts they, uh, they need to make um, is something that we'll look at a little bit more in depth um, later. Um, then the... Um, the Act has a couple of minimum requirements in relation to the procedure. Um, the receipt of the reported information must be confirmed, and then the facts must be discussed with the persons who reported the information. Um, companies must have written rules of procedure, and there's some minimum requirements in relation to the persons who are entrusted with conducting the procedure. So you must offer minimum guarantees of impartiality. Um, Companies must provide information in relation to the functioning, the purpose um, and the accessibility um, of the grievance mechanism, and they must protect people who access the grievance mechanism. So they must protect the confidentiality, they must protect them against disadvantage and uh, pr uh, protect them from punishment. And as all other elements of the due diligence management system of the risk management system, also the grievance mechanisms effectiveness must be reviewed once a year and on an ad hoc basis. Um, the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act, I want to uh, move to the next slide, um, requires effective and appropriate action in relation to almost all uh, aspects of the due diligence management system, where we've seen this little 
wheel um, on the last slide, and also in relation to um, the grievance mechanism, effective and appropriate action is required. Um, and I want to yeah, highlight the requirements of, of the appropriate manner, because this is really decisive in understanding what exactly companies have to do, especially in relation to making accessible the grievance mechanism. Um, the appropriate manner, you, you might know this already, this is something that I've mentioned uh, in all the other sessions of this webinar series, uh, because it's so key to understanding the requirements of the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. The appropriate manner um, consists of four uh, requirements or groups of requirement, um, which are interrelated and don't stand in a particular hierarchy um, to one another. Um, so this means they have to cons be considered equally and in an, in an easier case, all of them are either fulfilled in a really, to a really small extent or really intensively, but typically you will find a, a mixed situation where some requirements are fulfilled uh, strongly and others are met only a little bit. And then it's obviously um, up to companies uh, to decide who have a margin of uh, appreciation in this context. How, how they are going to weigh the requirements to one another and how they are going to apply it on the specific situation. And um, the appropriate manner has to be decided um, every time in relation to each human rights impact that has been uh, identified in relation to the different actors in the supply chain, in relation to different um, in relation to different um, yeah, uh, business uh, parts of their own uh, operations. And yes, you find the requirements of the left hand, uh, on the left hand side of the slide, just to explain them briefly, nature and extent of the company's activities. That's on the one hand, what resources are available to the company. And so how, uh, what financial capabilities, especially they have, but also um, how risk prone the activities are and the value chains are in general. Then the ability to influence the party directly responsible for the violation typically expected severity, reversibility, and probability of the occurrence of a violation and the nature of the causal contribution to a violation. So the more intensely they're met, these criteria, the more is required of a company to act in relation to all the elements and also in relation to um, the grievance mechanism. And especially, you'll see this later, when it comes to determining the groups of people who are the target group for the grievance mechanism, because obviously, Companies don't have to design a grievance mechanism that's accessible to every single person in the world. Um, before we go into the accessibility of the grievance mechanism, I want to quickly uh, just um, talk about the formal requirements um, that, are, that are set forth by the uh, German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. So I've mentioned already there must be written rules of procedure, so written, uh, rules of procedure in text form, and they must be made available publicly and there's some minimum requirements uh, in relation to these uh, to, yeah, for rules of procedure and text form. So they must uh, describe the scope of the procedure, possible complaints, channels, the conduct of the procedure. If companies choose to implement um, a procedure of amicable settlement, this obviously must be described as well. And uh, these rules of procedure must uh, mention the contact person or persons and responsible departments. And uh, what these rules of procedure must also describe is how exactly companies achieve the protection against disadvantage of punishment. Um, this is obviously very key to people who access a grievance mechanism because they might fear that um, their situation might um, yeah, become very problematic after having accessed such a mechanism. And there's also some uh, very little requirements in relation to suitability and qualification of the internal contact person. I've mentioned that they must offer some minimum guarantees in relation to impartiality. And this impartiality must be um, guaranteed by structural requirements within the company. So the company must make it possible for the persons that they have tasked with conducting the grievance mechanism, that they actually act uh, impartially, for example, by making sure that um, they don't act under the directive of a superior who's not tasked um, with conducting the grievance mechanism. Obviously, in other contexts of being an employee, they, they act under the uh, directive of, other, of others, but in relation to this task, they must be acting impartially. 
And also the company must provide adequate training and sufficient time resources to these people so that they can actually fulfill their roles. Um, next, I want to discuss the accessibility of the grievance mechanism. So I mentioned already, um, the law says it must be available to both um, potentially affected persons, but also third parties. And uh, when we talk about the things that companies have to do in order to make the grievance mechanism accessible, I've mentioned before that um, yeah, the companies must provide information in relation to the accessibility of the mechanism and its, uh, its purpose and procedure. And the question here obviously is to whom? So do they have to provide this kind of information to every single person in the world or all third persons who potentially could use the grievance mechanism or maybe to other people? And in relation to that, and this is both uh, relevant uh, in relation to providing the information, but also in relation to the design of the grievance mechanism, um, because the, the design of the mechanism might make it more or less accessible to potentially affected persons and third parties, companies need to take a look at the uh, criteria of the appropriate manner that I showed at the very beginning of my uh, presentation and use these criteria in order to identify the potential target groups of the uh, grievance mechanism. And um, who could be these, these groups? Obviously, it's, yeah, companies must put into center potentially affected persons and especially vulnerable groups. Examples of these vulnerable groups you can find on the right hand side of the slide. And um, companies can very easily identify these target groups um, by conducting the risk analysis. Um, the grievance mechanism now is one of the elements of the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act that has to um, ex like be effective and available, uh, has to be installed um, from the moment um, from which on companies fall within the scope of the act. So for companies with at least 3,000 employees in Germany, it's the 1st of January 2023, from which on they must have the grievance mechanism. And obviously the risk analysis, the annual risk analysis is something that they have to do in the course of the first year in which they fall within the scope of the act. So in the course of 2023, and it's possible in this context that companies have to have a grievance mechanism, but don't yet have conducted their risk analysis. And in this context, um, it's possible obviously to, to use, later on use the risk analysis to fine tune uh, who, who are these target groups and fine tune the, the um, uh, grievance mechanism in order to make it more available. And this is obviously something I've mentioned also that the effectiveness of the mechanism must be reviewed an, annually and on an ad hoc basis. And that's something um, that has to be regularly uh, done. So once the grievance mechanism is installed, it doesn't mean that, um, yeah, this is something that companies don't need to take care of anymore. Um, yeah, potentially affected persons can be internal and external persons, and companies need to consult or should consult um, potentially affected persons or their legitimate representations in order to get information necessary to design the grievance mechanisms. Um, and what is uh, not only possible, but what, if, what we are seeing a lot in practice is that companies choose to um, use different types of procedures in relation to different target groups because it makes it more or less accessible. Um, it might be problematic, for example, if um, yeah, an, an obliged company in Germany uh, contacts uh, their supplier abroad who is um, yeah who has 100 obliged companies as their customer and ask them to put up um, information posters in relation to the accessibility of the grievance mechanism and the one, the 900, uh, the 99 other companies ask them to do the exact same thing. Obviously this is problematic because it doesn't make the mechanism more accessible, rather it creates um, confusion <laughs> among the employees of the supplier in, in relation yeah, as to which is the right uh, mechanism to contact now. And so in this context, companies are reacting to that and are choosing to use um, um, yeah, external grievance mechanism, for example, in the context of a branch initiative um, in relation to especially the deeper supply chain, but also in contexts when the supplier has a lot of customers uh, and have an internal mechanism for themselves and maybe the employees of the direct supplier. 
Um, then the next slide, I'm taking a look at the um, yeah, requirements in relation to the procedure. I mentioned that um, the G uh, German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act has a couple of minimum requirements in relation to the procedure. Um, yeah, the receipt of the information uh, must be documented and confirmed, and then companies must provide information to the persons reporting the information in relation to the next steps, the procedure and their rights. Um, next is uh, stage two, the assessment and clarification of facts. So companies must assess the complaint. In case they reject the complaint, they must provide justification to the per person who reported the information. And if they don't reject the complaint, they must discuss the facts uh, with the person who reported. So in this context, I mean rejection and because um, the complaint, for example, is outside the scope of the mechanism. Um, next comes stage three, solution remedy and end of the procedure. Um, so companies must develop a suggestion to provide remedy with the person who reported the information and then obviously implement and monitor the remedial measures and later on evaluate the results of the measure together with the person who reported the information. And I mentioned that there's annual and ad hoc uh, requirements in relation to assessing the effectiveness of the grievance mechanism. Um, if this effectiveness assessment uh, leads to yeah, information requiring a review and adaptation of the procedure, companies must do that. And also they must use the learnings and the information from the grievance mechanism in the risk analysis. And throughout the whole procedure, they must communicate um, with a reporting person in a transparent and continuous way. And also they must protect the reporting person. That's something I've mentioned before. So they must protect them against um, yeah, against uh, disadvantage, against punishment, and also protect their confidentiality and must implement um, adequate uh, measures uh, and design the grievance mechanism in, in a way that um, allows for this type of protection. On the next slide, I want to talk about collaboration and uh, grievance mechanisms. Um, those of you who have um, attended the webinar uh, in relation to the knock-on effects of the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act know this already. Um, obviously, since the grievance mechanism must be accessible not only to um, persons in the context of the own operations of a company, but obviously to persons in the supply chain, so persons who are employed or are neighboring to direct and indirect suppliers, companies need to collaborate with their suppliers in order to um, create effective uh, grievance mechanisms. So obliged companies need information um, from their suppliers in, in many cases in order to design a grievance mechanism that fulfills the requirements. So they need information in relation to potentially affected persons and their situation, for example, residence, language, cultural practices, literacy uh, fears and types of potential grievances. Um, and then in order to provide information in an appropriate manner um, at, at a supplier's uh, factory, for example, they need at least their consent. It won't be possible to have leaflets or posters uh, in the factory of a supplier without them uh, agreeing uh, to that. Um, <clears throat> And oftentimes this is something um, that is very difficult when, um, for example, employees of a supplier want to um, address the grievance mechanism of a customer, but they don't actually know who the customers of their supplier are. So it's very possible that um, obliged companies will turn towards their suppliers and ask that they, for example, add demand of them in the context of a code of conduct. So want them to, le to legally oblige themselves to provide information in relation to who are the customers of this supplier to the employees or also to um, neighboring people and communities uh, upon request. And it's also possible, I've talked about um, protective measures in relation to protection against disadvantage or punishment that obliged companies need to do uh, in relation to people who access the grievance mechanism. And it's also possible in this context that obliged companies require their supplier to uh, implement these safeguard me uh, measures as well in relation to their um, employees in case they use the grievance mechanism. 
So turning to my last slide, um, I want to show you the effectiveness criteria um, from the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. And first of all, you might um, ask yourselves, we've been talking about the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. How come we're not talking about the effectiveness criteria from the UNGP? Um, the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act intends to implement the UNGP by, by way of, of an actual law in the German context and um, is based on the UNGP. So you will find many things that are very similar. The management system is almost identical. There's some, some slight differences, but generally is understood as implementing the UNGP and being based on the UNGP. And the UNGP are used as a tool to interpret the requirements of the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. And when we're looking at the requirements in relation to the uh, grievance mechanism and the, the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act, and we keep in mind that it has to be effective and appropriate, uh, we we need to take recourse to the effectiveness criteria uh, from the UNGP. Um, just to give you a quick overview, um, grievance mechanism must be legitimate, transparent, predictable, accessible, something that we talked at a bit more in depth, um, rights compatible and equitable and uh, companies need to take especially a look at barriers to access. I've talked about the requirements under the German due diligence and supply chains act what companies need to do in order to provide access to their grievance mechanism and here you find some information in relation to barriers to access that um, should be overcome uh, with the measures that I have described um, so I'm, I'm seeing that I've already used up a lot of the time that was uh, allocated to me. And um, yeah, I hope that you found this presentation helpful and interesting. And I'm very um, yeah, happy to hear your remarks and questions. Thank you so much, Michaela. As usual, very insightful and really glad uh, to have you on board here. We have a bunch of questions, both in the chat and the Q&A box. Uh, so starting off, uh, maybe going back to the slide uh, related to the formal requirements. So here there's a question related to uh, the external party or third party uh, uh, involvement here, whether that is actually a formal requirement. It was listed at the very bottom of the slide. I don't know, Elsa, if we can quickly pop back to, pop, pop back to that slide <clears throat> a bit more. It's in the very beginning yeah, one, one to the right i know which slide it is so what exactly is the question again sorry so the question is if the external party or third party is actually a formal requirement i know there's also nothing in relation to that on the slide so um it was the slide that you just had and with blue colors formal requirements yes um <clears throat> I mean, there's no requirement to have a third party involved in the grievance mechanism, but there's minimum requirement in relation to suitability and qualification of the internal contact person. And um, if it's obviously an external grievance mechanism that company cho companies choose to implement, the same requirements must be met by the person, by the contact person um, that is conducting the ex external grievance mechanism to which the company is a party to. Yeah, and that also relates a bit to another question here. Um, it's partially answered. Uh, does it mean that grievances can be managed only by third parties? Factory HR team and labor unions cannot play a role in receiving and handling the grievance mechanisms? Not at all, actually. So uh, companies uh, can choose, and there's very, very good arguments for companies uh, to do that. Uh, to participate in an external grievance mechanism. And such a grievance mechanism can also be one in the context, for example, of a multi-stakeholder initiative. And there are a lot of advantages in relation to the requirements that we've seen to, for example, accessibility, to um, creating trust in the mechanism. So one of the barriers to access um, a, a grievance mechanism that's external, uh, that is organized by a third party, by a multi-stakeholder initiative, by a branch initiative, um, will enjoy a lot more trust in, in most cases by potential users because it will be seen as more independent and also they will have less fear in most cases of uh, punishment or other forms of retaliation for using the grievance mechanisms. And there's also huge advantages in relation to the accessibility um, 
simply because it's very confusing when a supplier has thousands of customers and they all have their own grievance mechanism and now they're trying to implement measures in relation to making it accessible to the employees of this supplier. I mean, it's virtually impossible for people then to understand who is actually a potential contact person and to whom can we turn. So especially in relation to the deeper supply chain, it makes a lot of sense um, to implement an external, external grievance mechanism also because in many cases, companies have not yet made their supply chains transparent enough to know who are the actors beyond their direct suppliers. And having an external grievance mechanism, for example, in a specific region uh, might be very helpful in this context for, for making it more accessible. Indeed. Yeah. And that's also one of the reasons why we've uh, set up the sustainable uh, or the supply chain grievance mechanism. So Laura will uh, uh, talk about that a bit later. Um, maybe also one question related to, to the person in, uh, you know, in charge of managing this. So uh, can you name any sources for adequate training for the internal contact person? And uh, I also yeah. would ask uh, Laura if she, she, she uh, also wants to speak to that for a second. Uh, but Michaela first, please. Yeah, that's a really good question. So on the one hand, this person needs to understand the own structures of the company, but they also need to understand how to implement effective grievance mechanisms. There's very good information out there in relation to that. One is quoted at the bottom of the page. This is obviously available at, as of now only in German. I know that there is the intent to translate it, but it's not yet um, finished the translation of the guidance of the um, German competent authority. Um, there is um, a great um, guidance from the German Global Compact. It's called um, Worth Listening uh, in relation to effective uh, grievance mechanisms, especially in relation to the creation of effective grievance mechanisms. And what's also a really good tool, in my opinion, is our um, SME Compass, the first component, the due diligence compass with its phase on grievance mechanisms. Um, but in addition to that, the persons to, who are responsible for the mechanisms, they need to have um, yeah, information in relation to um, yeah, potential reasons for human rights violations in the specific country context um, in order to be able to manage the, uh, the grievances appropriately. Um, and yeah, there's, there's a lot of information out there, but there's uh, huge, huge differences when in relation to for which country or regional context, for example, information exists. Um, I don't know one central guidance that I could recommend in this context. Thanks. Laura, you want to compliment? Um, yeah, just a little bit. Of course, this um, depends on the system and on the person and on the responsibilities. Uh, the way we see it is we have uh, two levels to this within Amphory. So we have the persons within our members, within member brands, who are responsible for handling the grievances, who we have trainings for that we inform them how to use the system, what they should be responsible for, what they should expect. On the other hand, and I think this is also where the, um, the surplus or the other benefits of a collective mechanism to come into place, is that we have the external support, uh, both locally, so local investigation and mediation handlers, who are sensitive to all these uh, cultural topics, for example, who know local labor laws, and can, who can then inform also our members and the persons who are involved about what the situation really is. And then we also have the grievance coordinators uh, within the speaker change system who make everything go according to the rules of procedure. So that way, it also, it also eliminates the need for very extensive training within the member brands themselves because they have the support of local persons. And this is also very key is to have that local insight. Yeah, yeah, which leads me to a comment that was made in the chat specifically on uh, on this, that uh, the internal contact person also must be sensitive to ethical and cultural sensitivities of workers yeah. in case of supply chains where overseas migrant workers are engaged indeed. So it's uh, critical to also understand the local context, uh, the workforce composition and so on. And of course, uh, Amphori Insights also gives our members uh, great, uh, a great overview of the workforce composition in their global supply chains. Uh, so if you see, for instance, that, you know, you have a lot of migrant workers in your supply chains, there are certain risks that come with that, that you need to be aware of and take into account in uh, uh, also uh, setting up for instance, grievance mechanism, considering that it needs to be accessible in their languages and so on and so forth. So this is also yeah. something we take into account when we set up our own. Michelle, you want to add something? 
<laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Um, obviously, in relation to having an inter when companies choose, and many companies do choose to do that together with having an external mechanism, so most companies combine. But in relation to the internal grievance mechanism and to the internal contact person, um, it's, it's not required that these individuals have regional uh, this information in relation to cultural sensitivities to the legal situation and so on to over 190 countries that exist in the world or even in relation to all the companies into which the supply chains go of the specific company but it's obviously possible that they can also then take recourse to uh, external or other internal information so a lot of information might be existing in different departments in the company or also in um yeah, and in, in different subsidiaries uh, around the world and uh, something that they can in, in this context then must take recourse to. Indeed, thanks, Michaela. Uh, we have a bunch of other questions here. So uh, next one is, can you clarify whether a web page made available on a company's website to lodge grievances is sufficient to meet the German Supply Chain Act's uh, accessibility requirements? Yeah, I mean, the lawyer always says it depends. <laughs> and it, it really depends. If we go to the next slide, uh, you again see a little overview of the potentially vulnerable groups um, that might be the people you want to create access for, for your grievance mechanism. And if there's people who don't have access to the internet, who are illiterate, or who don't even know that this company's website exists, or that this, is, this company is one of the customers of the the supplier to which they're neighboring or where they're working, um, a, a, an email address on the website is not sufficient. Um, and it, it can be sufficient if you'll have a lot of people that um, are third parties that are not central, uh, that are not part of the target group to whom this must be available as well. For them, it's sufficient to have an, an email website or phone hotline or something like that. But in relation to the target group, uh, companies must do uh, more to create um, to create access, and they must really look at what are the specific needs um, of these people in order to design a grievance mechanism in an adequate way. Yeah, indeed. Um, next question relates to the OECD's national contact points. Uh, um, so the question is, uh, how does this grievance mechanism procedure relate to the procedures mm -hmm. of the national contact point procedures and how is it different? Yeah, I mean, in order to describe the difference, we would have to take a look at the specific uh, procedural rules of all the grievance mechanisms that companies and uh, MSIs and so on are now um, implementing in relation to the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act. Uh, one key difference is that the national contact point procedure is a, is a mediation procedure, but it's also based on voluntary, um, yeah, on, on the free will of the parties joining the procedure. And these procedures are independent of one another. So just because there's a national contact points procedure, companies are not freed. So if it's an OECD member, if they're based in an OECD member state like Germany, and there is the national contact point procedure, this does not free company, relief companies from the obligation to have an internal and or external grievance mechanism. And um, it's possible for potentially affected persons to to contact different avenues, to contact um, the internal or external grievance mechanism and also have a procedure at the national contact point. Thanks, Michaela. Next question relates to uh, whistleblower protection, whether that's a part of grievance mechanisms or vice versa. Yeah, I mean, this is a really, really good question. And I think the existence of the uh, whistleblower protection uh, directive, and now there's also the law in Germany, uh, is one of the main reasons why companies choose to have two systems. So many companies, and I think this is a really smart way to go about this, um, try to um, yeah, combine the requirement to have a grievance mechanism with the requirement to have um, communication channels under the whistleblower directive. Um, and yeah, I mean, the there's some similarities there's also differences in relation to for example to the target group it's different and um, the the scope of the procedure is different so the whistleblower directive relates to the violation of specific um, eu legislation and not in relation to uh, potential or actual negative impacts on human rights in the environment although there's some overlap obviously for example eu 
Um, atomic regulation um, also relates to negative impacts to the environment. And there's a couple more where you'll find uh, put potential, potentially overlapping scenarios. Um, but it makes sense to combine the two because, um, because of the similarities and obviously of the, the synergetic effects mm -hmm. that are created when you combine the two and also in relation to um, protection of confidentiality, to protection against um, punishment or the disadvantages. Um, both are very similar and the directive for whistleblowers contains more granular rules and very specific technical requirements in relation to, for example, protection uh, of confidentiality. And I think this is um, a really good resource to also take recourse to when wondering how exactly can I protect the confidentiality um, in, a, in a technical way or in a structural way. Um, so this is a really good, good starting point, but make sure you extend the procedure from the scope of potential grievances that can be brought and also in relation to the target group, which are really, really different. So the whistleblower directive um, is meant for employees and freelance employees of companies um, who have, have uh, yeah, who want to inform uh, about a violation of EU legislation and not in relation to, um, yeah, people who are um, affected by negative uh, human rights and environmental impacts. Thanks, Michaela. There is now a question that relates to two different scenarios. Um, so one is, uh, you know, if a company um, uh, doesn't have a map of its supply chain, but it assumes it has origins in a high-risk country mm -hmm. area, for instance, battery producer uh, with origins in the DRC uh, or DRC's cobalt belt, um, uh, you know, how is the company supposed to act or, and the other scenario is when there's no supplier consent, uh, how is the company supposed to act? Mm -hmm. So the first scenario is so not having specific knowledge in relation to the deeper supply chain, but having, um, very good information that makes specific problems very, very likely, like specific resources predominantly coming from certain parts of the world. And this is a problem that many companies have. And, um, you know, the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act creates this misunderstanding by overly emphasizing on operations and direct suppliers and obligations existing in the deeper supply chain only in case of the certain knowledge threshold, substantiated knowledge. This creates the misunderstanding in a lot of companies actually that they don't have to act in relation to the deeper supply chain. And if you look at the requirements of effectiveness in appropriate manner, and you, you, you put them next to substantiate and knowledge, it becomes very clear that actually where you have to focus on is where the problems are, which is the deeper supply chain, and the substantiated knowledge requirements are very low. So it's sufficient that there's information, for example, in relation to uh, high risk in the country, high risk in the branch, uh, for example. And in this case, you would have substantiated knowledge in relation to suppliers of which you know of certain types exist in the deeper supply chain, but you don't actually know who they are, how you can contact them, and so on. Um, you need to work on making these actors more transparent uh, continuously, but you also need to implement a grievance mechanism that's accessible to potentially affected persons. And you don't know if these are potentially affected persons of your actual supplier or just of a, of a different supplier who's very similar to your actual supplier. So in this context, it makes a lot of sense to um, make your either internal grievance mechanism accessible to uh, people affected by cobalt mining in the uh, cobalt belt in the DRC or to join an external grievance mechanism who is accessible to people in this region, in this uh, context. And the, um, the second question, if the supplier doesn't consent to um, yeah, providing for information in relation to making accessible the grievance mechanism, um, this is a very unusual situation, and I can only imagine very few scenarios in which suppliers might be resistant to that, one of them being uh, in the context, in politically very repressive contexts, where suppliers, um, for reasons of their own protection in the political context in which they're operating, have to say no, for example, to signing a code of conduct, con conduct where it says human rights all the time. 
Um, you need to work on using sensitive language in contexts like that, for example, in the in the context of China, and you can work together with these suppliers and make make it possible for them to collaborate with you in the by using sensitive uh, language and, and allowing them to join into this communication in a way that doesn't put them at risk. Um, context in which there's also context in which uh, supplier companies say, oh, no, I don't want that. This is mostly a, a pushback trend that I'm observing by German companies who are not obliged by the act um, as a reaction to this really abusive practice from obliged companies to uh, design these uh, code of conduct and give them to their suppliers to sign them where the suppliers say, I do everything, um, I guarantee everything is fine, you don't need to worry. And now we see a pushback. So we, we talked about this a lot in the webinar on knock-on effects. And now we see a pushback by not obliged uh, German companies to that where they just say, no, I'm not obliged, I'm not doing anything, I, I won't sign anything in the context of uh, companies uh, outside of Germany, especially companies in the global south, I have not yet heard that companies just say, no, I don't want that. Usually they're very interested in finding out how they can collaborate effectively, how they can prepare for the German Due Diligence and Supply Chains Act, but also for the uh, CSDD for the European Directive, because they understand that um, binding uh, due diligence requirements uh, are coming, they're here to stay, and it's necessary to prepare for this in order to stay competitive. Indeed. Uh, another very important question here relating to uh, how to track the effectiveness. So how will effectiveness and efficiency of agreements mechanism be monitored and evaluated? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a really good question as well. I don't really have uh, one, uh, one sentence answer to that. Um, I mean, the information that you get from the risk analysis and also the feedback that you get in the context of evaluating the grievance mechanism with the personal report of the information, I think are the, the best starting points for such an evaluation. Maybe if we go one slide forward and we look at the requirements in relation to the procedure at the, of the grievance mechanism, again, we see in this phase four effectiveness assessment, um, yeah, that it has to be done annually. Uh, there must be adaptation and the learnings must be used. And in the, sorry, in the phase before, phase three solution, remedy and end, the uh, results must be evaluated together with the person who reported the information and feedback from the person who participated in such a procedure uh, might be really, really important in relation to uh, the effectiveness of the procedure. There's some context though in which such an evaluation is very difficult. For example, if you have no grievances, um, this could either mean that things are very good, but it's also very possible that it means people don't know of your grievance mechanism and you don't yet have made it accessible enough. And then if you have no grievances, for example, it's also very difficult to review um, how the, um, the procedure is such um, or how the uh, requirements and really how the, the people that you task with this task, um, how well they're working in this context because you basically have no no test case from which can derive information. Yeah, indeed. And uh, ironically, many, many submissions or grievances uh, indeed uh, gets to gets to show that the grievance mechanism is quite uh, accessible and that uh, a lot of uh, workers are aware of it. Uh, so in that sense, it's not necessarily a bad sign uh, because it means that your, your procedure works. Yeah. Um, there is here, sorry, Michaela, please. Um, yeah, just uh, to have some to give you some idea where you can uh, learn more about this. The, I've mentioned the UN, uh, the German Global Compact Network's uh, guidance um, worth listening. And there's a lot of information in relation to uh, reviewing the effectiveness of the grievance mechanism that I find very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Then there's also a question related to you know different barriers. Uh, so there were mentions, so for instance, trust, language, awareness. Mm -hmm. uh, that are quite significant and uh, you know the question here is what are your recommendations to mitigate or overcome these barriers or if this uh, will still be discussed um, I mean we, we discussed parts of it maybe you can just keep that fairly short but um, yeah. yeah this is something that's very difficult to be kept short because in relation to all the different barriers of access 
there are different possible solutions and they really depend on the specific context. So maybe if we go two slides further, we can have an, a look again at the typical barriers to access. Um, so lack of awareness that you need to better communicate, but what this type of communication could be uh, really also depends on the, on the specific context. So why do they lack information? What type of information in what form could it be provided to the person? So you need a lot of information in relation to uh, the identity and situation of the potential users of the target group uh, in order to figure out how you can create more Awareness language, obviously, you need to provide information in the right language, functional illiteracy, potential costs. If it's a hotline, for example, this might create phone costs. If people don't really have um, a phone, then people's physical location. Um, yeah, it really depends on the, especially in relation to the last two, it really depends on the specific cultural, regional context. It depends on the situation in which people find themselves in their, in their company. In some contexts, people are very fearful, especially if they're um, affected by poverty. They might feel that they have no room for maneuver because they might lose the little uh, resources they have to survive, uh, might live in a very repressive environment, either uh, because of the state structures or because of the working environment, is, which will make it very, very difficult for them uh, to access such a mechanism. Um, what, something that is very helpful, especially in relation to the last two but typical barriers of access, is actually external grievance mechanisms, in my opinion, because um, yeah, there's generally more trust. You're not contacting the, the company that maybe created the problem and telling them yeah, you did something wrong, making you um, a potential target, uh, but instead a more neutral third party. So this uh, is something that could be very, very helpful, but it really depends on the specific context and might vary a lot. Yeah. Another question here related to where the responsibility of brands stops. Uh, here the concern is that uh, uh, it's a question from a brand uh, receiving hundreds of grievances every month from supply chain workers, some of them are related to minor issues such as missing drinking water and it's hard to address them all. So where does the responsibility of brands stop in addressing grievances in supply chain? Um, just comment maybe also from my side, minor, uh, like no access to drinking water, I think is, is not uh, a minor issue, um, but uh, especially in contexts like farms and things where, where heat stroke is not uncommon. Um, but anyways, Michaela, please, uh, if you have an answer to this one. Yeah, I mean, um, the responsibility is most relevant in the context of remedy because companies need to uh, create the grievance mechanism and must make it available to all uh, potentially affected persons in their supply chain, especially to those who might be more intensely negatively affected by their, uh, by their operation and by their uh, value creation along the value chain. Uh, when it comes to remedy, it's often a question who is responsible for what? Uh, shouldn't the supplier, for example, provide for water? Maybe the supplier has uh, 100 others, other customers who should also be taking care of this issue. Um, in this context, companies should be um, yeah, speaking to the other actors potentially responsible for remedy and try to fi find a solution in relation to who bears the costs. But uh, it, it really depends, especially on their own contribution in this context, how much companies are allowed to withdraw because there is always the risk that a situation is created in which all the companies are saying, oh, this is actually not my issue. I'm not responsible here. And then people are kind of left in limbo where always uh, every every person that's every actor that's being addressed says like yeah don't speak to me speak to speak to the others so this is a situation that needs to be prevented um companies of, of responsibility for remedy in the context of the german diligence and supply chains act can also exceed um remedy in, uh, in exceed their own contribution so it can be necessary that they remedy something that they have not only uh, and not alone contributed to or maybe contributed to only in a to a smaller extent, uh, but it really depends on how uh, and to what extent the requirements of appropriate manner are fulfilled and also how much these requirements are fulfilled 
uh, by other actors who potentially owe remedy in this context. Hmm. All right, we have a bunch of other questions. I'm afraid we will not be able to uh, get through all of them. Um, I'll leave it with one here, and then maybe Michaela, uh, if you were able to to answer some of them in, in writing, we'll move on to the other presentation. So it's in the in the Q and A box. Um, just one last question here. Uh, it relates to um, um, well, it, basically. Factories that have already been audited uh, through BSCI, RAP, GOTS, et cetera, um, where the operation, le or operation level grievance mechanism is a requirement. Uh, the question is if that is uh, sufficient uh, uh, already as compared to, a, so for instance, setting up supply chain grievance mechanism. So, Michaela. Yeah, so a German obliged company, so a German company that's obliged under the German due diligence and supply chains act is not relieved of the obligation to have a grievance mechanism internal external um, if their supplier has a grievance mechanism. Okay, that's short, crisp and very clear. Thank you so much. Um, I move on now to uh, the next presentation by my colleague uh, Laura Wautas, uh, who will be introducing you to uh, our approach to access to remedy and uh, more specifically our supply chain grievance mechanism, which is some for to sol solution to helping uh, you as, as members to, um, uh, to really uh, meet that uh, obligation uh, in certain uh, instances. So, Laura, please, floor is yours. Thanks, Francis. So indeed, um, I'll be speaking today about our, spe our speak for change program, which is our supply chain level grievance mechanism, and really how we felt that this was the right way forward for our members, specifically because it does so collaboratively and also lowers the need uh, for resources, but also makes it more effective. Before I go into that, I want to touch briefly upon the, uh, on the global access remedy approach of M4E, which you see here on the slide, uh, which consists of four pillars. So we have, first and foremost, the operational level grievance mechanisms. Everything that we do within the access remedy approach is also meant at strengthening these because in many instances, uh, the best way forward for complaints is to find resolution through an operational level grievance mechanism. These exist at production locations and farms throughout um, our member supply chains and already are uh, focused upon through m 4 bsci and BSCI audits. And we also have trainings and capacity buildings on these. So we really encourage our uh, business partners and our members to continue working on these to strengthen access to remedy on the first level. Now, realistically, we know that sometimes they don't exist or they're not functioning very well or workers don't trust them. In that instance, it's very important to have a supply chain level grievance mechanism, not only to um, answer let's say, the legislative needs, but also just to um, have more access to remedy, have more insights in your supply chain. That's why we've, we've set up our own system, uh, which is called Speak for Change. And it's how we support employee members in providing access to remedy throughout the supply chains to workers and communities uh, where grievances cannot or have not been dealt with through local operation level grievance mechanisms. The reason that we see a lot of value in doing it collaboratively is it requires a lot less effort and resources on our members' parts, specifically, for example, uh, when they're SMEs but also because it makes it much more effective down the supply chain towards uh, producers and farms, for example. Because indeed, as Michaela just touched upon, the goal is not to have 100 systems running next to each other at production facilities. The goal is really to have a good accessible system that workers can use that then links all of the relevant sourcing brands into um, an issue or complaint that comes forward. Finally, we have the employee grievance mechanism, which is really there uh, about employee staff or employee services. And finally, we also want to highlight the Access to Remedy Hub. It's a creation of a global Access to Remedy Hub that is managed by neutral international organizations where we connect with the global community working on Access to Remedy. And we also uh, collaborate, uh, share learnings and share insights in order to maximize efforts. On that note, we're also collaborating with a lot of other organizations on this. So that's a little bit the overview of our access to remedy approach, but then specifically our supply chain level grievance mechanism or speak for change is what we're here to talk about today. So uh, first, why do we need a supply chain level grievance mechanism? Aside from the legislative needs uh, to comply with existing and upcoming uh, legislation, it helps you get a lot of additional visibility into labor risks in your supply chain, because of course, uh, workers, community members, affected parties are your best source of information about how things are really happening um, uh, throughout your supply chain. It also then gives you actionable insights throughout these complaints, throughout the issues that are raised to help you de-risk your operations and your sourcing, 
based on this data and real-time analytics that you can combine with risk assessments, audit results, for example, to really get a holistic uh, whole overview of uh, the current situation. And it allows you to use joint leverage to resolve complaints. It means you have a lot more impact um, together with, for example, in the system, Amphori members uh, to resolve issues in a cost-efficient manner with support of Amphori and independent third parties. I think this is a key element because we have these independent third parties locally who are experts in cultural situations, local labor laws that can help you effectively resolve complaints and provide the best form of remedy. Now, of course, aside from the reasons, we also need to have a scope. And so our speaker change mechanism aims to address complaints related to m 4 members' business partners that either touch upon the m 4 BCI code of conduct or the responsible purchasing practices. So that's also because, for example, our business partners um, and our members commit to upholding the m 4 BCI code of conduct. And in some instances, it does go further than local labor law. So it means that we can touch upon a more varied um, range of topics. And we've tried to keep it as accessible as possible in the sense that grievances can be submitted by workers and their representatives, trade unions, employers, organizations, community members, uh, NGOs, importers, or whistleblowers. Uh, so we try to keep it as broad as possible, but it does need to be linked to an employee BCI code of conduct, the responsible purchasing practices, and needs to be linked to an employee business partner. Now, where are we today in terms of scope? Uh, we piloted in Vietnam. Um, we currently are still fully operational in the country. After this pilot, we got together all of the learnings and insights and worked on making an official employee service. And we're currently working on the scale-up strategy um, with Turkey, Bangladesh, and India as our first target countries. With some exciting news about Turkey, whereas this week is also launch week and onboarding week. So that means that from next week onwards, our system will also be live in Turkey as the next country. Now, our long-term objective is to get this program in all of the relevant sourcing countries from foreign members, and we're working top-down. So we're working from the uh, most important sourcing countries for our members to these important sourcing countries. Now, if we move forward about how the system actually works, um, it's a couple of characteristics. So it is fully anonymous. So complainants can remain anonymous throughout the entire life cycle of a complaint. Now, they are free to break this anonymity, of course, um, but they don't have to. Um, the only instance where you might, you know, ask this is if they if, uh, want a specific form of remediation, let's say reinstation, for example. But generally speaking, they can remain fully anonymous. It's inclusive that we have several access channels to um, get the program as accessible as possible. So we use uh, web surveys, online forms. We also have uh, IVR, which is a phone number they can call and then takes them to an automated menu. And we also have chat app integration. Depending on the country, uh, this might be a different chat app. For example, in Vietnam, we have Zalo. And in Turkey and other countries, we have uh, WhatsApp. It's compliant with GDPR. It's built to be scalable. So it's built to be scaled to different sectors, different regions, and different countries. Um, with the end goal being remedy through collaboration between employer members, business partners, and external parties that support. Now, how does it actually work? So how do we go through a system? Let's say we get a grievance in through one of the access channels. Um, we will then review the complaint to see whether or not it's within scope, uh, and if we have all the information that we need. Uh, we will then share it, let's say that's case, with all of the relevant members to avoid it alignment. So members are a key part in the entire process. Um, they will provide a lot of information, insights, and they will together decide on how to best move forward using one of the independent experts that Amphori has within each country. And these are different depending on the country because, of course, there's a different uh, layout. And we'll then go through the investigation, which will be the responsibility of the external party, so this external investigation expert. They will then get back with the first version of their findings, and this will be shared with all stakeholders. So that means Amphori members, it means the business partner, and it means the complainant. And they will all have the opportunity to provide feedback and insights to this. Now, it doesn't mean we necessarily have to take that feedback into account, but it's very important that everybody's voice is heard. It, because, for example, something may have been missed, something additional may have come up in the meantime. And so it's very important to show that we really want their insights on this and we want to work on this collaboratively. And we then follow up with a final investigation report. Uh, this will say whether or not the case is grounded or not grounded. If it's not grounded, case ends there, with, of course, an explanation on to why it was not grounded, uh, both towards uh, in detail towards all of the parties, but then also high level publicly without any identifying information. If it is grounded, we go to remediation. That follows the same steps. So we discuss with members. We get an, um, an external remediation expert in who will then work on the remediation plan. 
We'll also share a first version of a feedback with the complainant, with the business partner and with the members so that they can all provide their insights, maybe bring up new points or additional points they would like to see included. And they will then work on implementation of remediation plan with clear responsibilities highlighted also for who is responsible for what. Now, the only people who have access to all of the data are the linked members um, and then for staff. So business partners do not get access to the case management system, neither do complainants. We have the dedicated outreach channels to communicate with them. Um, however, they all get all of the same data in the sense of they all get the investigation reports and remediation plans and the final summary reports. Now we do have a tool that tracks high level metrics uh, that is available to all Amphorian members. And that means, for example, um, it, within a country or within the system, which percentage of uh, grievances are filed by workers, uh, which are the main topics in the country. And that helps also create a more global view on the risks, not only for all of the cases in Speak for Change, case, uh, Speak for Change, but it also allows members to pull that data for their own sourcing. So they can identify if there are any main issues that they need to work on. Now, this is how it works. It's also very important to, data, to inform that this is uh, all available in the local language. Um, and this is all always, um, not always the official language, but also other languages. For example, for Turkey, we have the system available in Turkish, but also in Arabic to um, accommodate the need for more accessibility to migrant workers, for example, which are vulnerable workers group. And it's very important to keep them in mind. So that's why we have extensive stakeholder consultations locally before we ever launch to understand how we could make the system as representative for the local needs as possible or to locally accessible as possible. So it depends on the country what that access is going to look like. Now, of course, in this high level, the detailed rules and procedures um, and all of the information can be found on the program website, which is going to be linked in the slide. There we go. So. All right. Thank you so much, Laura. And uh, we don't go into questions and answers. We actually move on to, uh, to Lara. Uh, so we go straight to the uh, presentation of the German PSD um, on how they support uh, access to remedy. Um, and then uh, on this note, um, uh, yeah, also would like to thank the German PSD for co-hosting this webinar series and for uh, supporting us throughout. So please, uh, Lara, floor is yours. And then after we take another break for, for Q&A, um, we will answer uh, questions both related to Laura's presentation and to Lara's presentation. Please, Lara, go on. Yeah, hi, everyone. Um, it's good to be here. And I'm happy to present um, the approach of the German Partnership for Sustainable Textiles towards um, grievance mechanism access to remedy. I try to keep it very short in order to allow for more questions. Um, I assume that most of you are a bit familiar with the PSD uh, setup, being a multi-stakeholder initiative focusing on improving um, working conditions in the textile and garment supply chain of the members. Um, we have several focus topics, and one of them is grievance mechanism and access to remedy. And this focus topic is also accompanied by a strategic group consisting of different representatives of our stakeholder groups. Um, so this group, um, together with this group, I reflect regularly on what we're currently doing with regard to this topic and also where we want to head in the immediate future or long term future. Um, so what do we focus on? Um, this is a very simplified um, picture, but I think that it yeah, summarizes the scope um, in which the PSD is working on or within. Um, so you see here the workers and the representatives and different channels that they could use um, um, ideally um, to um, issue complaints. Um, so below you see more on the factory floor, but then also more the external options they, they should and, and must have um, to raise complaints. So as the PST, um, we focus on different um, levels. Um, so we really want to promote factory internal grievance structures. So we work together in a pilot project, which I will explain in a minute, um, on strengthening these internal structures um, because we really want to promote and strengthen and capacitate workers and the representatives and management to solve issues um, on the ground. But at the same time, we also see the necessity and importance of certain safety nets, as we call them. Um, so external mechanisms, either by local organizations or by brands or cross company mechanisms. Um, so we also support local organizations um, who, uh, which are 
um, providing hotlines, a contact point for workers, so they really know the specific context of the region um, and are mostly known to, to the workers and the representatives. Um, but we also strengthen and support um, cross-company mechanisms of MSIs and sector initiatives. And here it's important to say that the PST has decided to not operate its own cross-company mechanism, but rather to support the existing ones. Um, and I think one of the, the main reasons here is that we see within the textile and garment supply chain, there are already quite a number of um, mechanisms um, out there. Um, we've just heard about the inform me mechanism. Um, you probably are very much familiar with the accord, which is now also to transfer to Pakistan, you know, the fair wear mechanism. So there is experience out there. There is more rolling out of mechanisms and we see that um, we might not contribute to this um, with another um, uh, mechanism, but rather to support the existing ones and see how we can collaborate and make this these different mechanisms also accessible um, for our members. And on the right side, you see, okay, now we have these different levels, but how can these different levels interact with each other? So we also um, are motivated to look into how the different systems complement each other, how they can be aligned, et cetera. And I will also explain this in a bit more, a bit more in, a, in a minute. Um, so how do we implement this in practice? Um, coming to my next slide, um, we do implement three pilot projects, um, each of them addressing one of the levels. Um, so we're working very closely together with the Fairware Foundation, which um, is opening or has been opening their grievance mechanism for a number of PST brands who are not Fairware members. Um, and we have piloted this in Vietnam and India in the last one and a half years. And we um, just started to scale this up to more countries um, to test it in more countries and see how two different initiatives with different members can collaborate on one um, grievance mechanism. Um, this is especially interesting also to smaller companies within the PST who do not have the capacities to set up their own mechanisms, but rather see how they can collaborate with a, with a third party complaints mechanism. Um, yeah, so this is one, one, one project that we're working on. Um, then we are um, strengthening factory internal grievance structures in Pakistan. Um, here we um, collaborated um, with Fair Trade Germany, who are implementing their textile program in India, and they have one component of factory internal um, complaints mechanisms that they transferred to the Pakistani context. Um, so here we worked with um, 16 factories of PST member brands. Um, um, throughout a longer training program and setting up factory internal grievance structures. It was a very insightful um, project, a very intense program with um, yeah, a small number of factories to really look into how this can work out on a long-term basis. Um, I think one of the key aspects was that we invested quite a lot of time into the onboarding of management to really get their support um, of, 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 this, of this project and also, of, of course, um, factory internal structures to really work on the business case also for them. Um, what, what is their benefit in having these um, systems um, in place, so quality and production criteria. And they were really engaged in this project. Um, and for a multiplier approach, we also made sure that every, all workers, every each and every worker in the factory knows about um, this internal structure. Um, we are now um, in a phase where we look into how can we proceed with this project. Um, it ended in April and we want to um, really go, go ahead and, and see how this um, improves um, yeah, after this, this first phase and how to onboard maybe more factories. And the third project is a support of a local NGO in Turkey. Um, it, the NGO is called Mudem and operates a worker support center um, that yeah, addresses mainly um, Syrian refugees working in the garment textile supply chain in Turkey and yeah, serves as a contact point for grievances and questions um, this particular vulnerable group that also Laura mentioned earlier um, is facing. Um, and we will also continue to support this um, um, local contact point um, until December 25. So these are the projects that we're implementing. Beyond that, um, on the next slide, you can see that we also organize and participate in workshops and webinars. Um, we have an overview of up-to-date guidance on the topic that our brands or members um, can use and yeah, um, understand the topic in a bit more detail. 
And we also, um, yeah, uh, operate or um, let's say collect um, data um, in the so-called incident list. It's not a complaints list because we do not receive um, official complaints um, at the PST, but we do collect reported cases of specific incidents in the textile and garment supply chain gathered from various sources, such as, for example, the Business and Human Rights Resource Center, the CCC Live Blog, Kina Intel, and others, um, and really have this list updated um, on a weekly basis. And this adds to the whole topic for members to really look into, okay, what risks do we face? What actual um, incidents happen in our supply chain? Those, these brands, uh, the, the members have access to this um, list and can check whether one of their factories um, is affected and then um, get in touch with the factory and, and solve the issue. Um, so this is just an additional source to, to understand um, what is happening in the supply chain. And then, um, what further collaboration do we promote? Um, this refers more to the right aspect of this picture that I showed earlier, um, alignment and cooperation. Um, you might have heard of the CARI platform, this ominous group, um, which um, stands for Collaboration on Access to Remedy. It is a group of several um, sector initiatives, multi-stakeholder initiatives that you can see here on the right. Um, that has come together um, for quite a while now um, to exchange on the topic of grievance mechanisms. The exchange started a couple of years ago at one of the OECD forums. So these different initiatives have several things in common. They all um, focus on at least the textile and garment supply chain, on human rights, environmental due diligence, and thus also the element of grievance mechanism and remedy. And um, yeah, this group intends to um, exchange experiences, lessons learned, um, good practices, um, to also identify synergies and align approaches and to jointly support members in promoting access to remedy. Um, this collaboration is now to be scaled up um, to a more yeah, formalized way. So as um, Chi said, we are supporting um, this group by an external service provider who accompanies this group now in really looking into how the different um, grievance approaches and mechanisms can be aligned, certain elements can be aligned, and how they can complement each other instead of existing in, in a certain silo, so to say. And um, two, uh, two, actually two um, specific collaborations have already evolved from this. Um, one I've already mentioned, this is the collaboration that we have with the Fairware on the opening of the Fairware mechanism for PST members. But another one that I want to mention here is um, one between Amfori, the PST, and Fairware. Um, so we have come up with a certain protocol on how to deal with grievances from shared factories of our members. So to make it more practical, if there is a complaint coming in at um, the Fairware's grievance mechanism or the Amfori mechanism, and it is of severe nature, we have come up with a certain criteria to give us a bit of guidance, um, we can we will look into whether there is any link between um, our members sourcing also from this factory. So it could be that um, a complaint is escalated to this collaboration and that PST members also source from this factory. So we make use of this collaboration to solve the issue and um, the complaint jointly. Um, yeah, so this is something that we are currently testing and hope to scale up to more initiatives um, in the near future. Yeah, that's it from my side. Try to keep it, keep it short um, to allow for a couple of more questions. Thank you so much, Laura. Excellent presentation. And we have already a couple of questions here. Um, first one relates to uh, Laura, uh, actually. So the question here is, uh, how does Mfuri implement the UN guiding principles effectiveness criteria in our work on the grievance mechanism, uh, for example, in the work that we've done in, in Vietnam. Laura, please. Yeah, indeed, thanks for this. Um, so the um, effectiveness criteria, the guiding principles, they were all key guidelines, of course, for setting up and speak for change. So we engaged with the OECD, with OHGHR, a number of these organizations who were setting up the grievance mechanism. And of course, these are also uh, the key things that we keep in mind when reviewing how things work, you know, how are things accessible, are they um, independent? Um, and so these are very much sort of our guidelines for setting the system up because we know that, of course, the legislations, the ones that exist, but also the ones that are coming, will be based mainly on this. So it's very much represented um, in the system, of course. Yeah. 
And then there's another question also also to you, and that relates to our launch in uh, in Bangladesh. Um, so the question is, how will this complement the Accords reporting channel? Um, so uh, yeah, maybe you can elaborate a bit on that. Of course, indeed, what we always try, aim to do or try to do is to have um, our system be as collaborative as possible, not only between members, uh, but also for us so that we collaborate with initiatives as much as we can, which is also one of the key focuses, for example, of the um, of the carry platform that Lara just spoke about that we're included in, but that also, of course, has the accord. So there's a lot of conversations ongoing uh, about these. Um, additionally, that's something that we're specifically looking into now for Bangladesh, so sort of understanding how ours could supplement, how it could be different. Now, there's a couple of things there, so BSCI covers a number of topics, um, whereas the course is very specific, not only about building safety, but a couple of other uh, topics, so they've done great work on those. Um, we don't see specifically uh, for now they would be exactly the same. We do say that we would cover additional topics or different topics, but we're very much in this conversation. So exactly how we're going to collaborate, I can't really say right now because we're in those conversations, uh, but it, um, it is very much a topic that we're focusing on and it's very important. Neat. And then there was another question that um, uh, Michaela already uh, answered in, in, in writing. Um, I believe it also uh, has a uh, Amphuri dimension to it, so maybe we can also look at it uh, again from, from our perspective. So the question was, how does the business model work? Do suppliers need to pay or only the company implementing the grievance mechanism? So of course, you know that uh, obligation to pay. Uh, important here, the answer from Michaela uh, was uh, how much a company within the scope of the German uh, Due Diligence Supply Chain Act has to pay for remedy is determined criteria for the appropriate manner especially relevant in this context are nature and extent of a company's operations, uh, ability to influence and own contribution. Uh, Laura, maybe you can also talk a bit to how we deal with this uh, question, because of course it's one that, that concerns members uh, in, in all the cases that come up. Um, mm -hmm. So please, if you can elaborate a bit on that one. Yeah, so there's two sides mainly to the financial aspect. So one is participation in the grievance mechanism. Uh, which we currently cover within the Amphorae membership fee um, because that means it's holistic uh, partnership. So that covers uh, the participation of members. Now, then there's a different thing that goes on once you receive a case where you have to have the investigation and specifically remediation. Now, who will be responsible for remediation? Not only the tasks set forward, but also let's say the financial compensation, for example, or financial angle is dependent on the case itself. Um, in very in many instances, for example, one person will be liable, other companies will be liable. So it depends on the topic of the case, it depends on the insights, the severity degree, and of course also possibilities in terms of who's going to be responsible for the remediation. Um, so it will vary from case to case. Uh, now, in terms of investigation, um, the investigation fee is currently split between the employee members linked to the business partner. Now, how they then manage this internally for now is up to them. Um, we, for now, we don't invoice business partners for participation in the program, as we think this would be a very demotivating factor for them to participate in the system. And we want them to be as supportive as possible about implementing Speak for Change, about including them, about briefing their workers, and seeing it as a way to improve. It's not necessarily a punishment mechanism. It's really a way just to identify any risks, any issues, and then help them remediate those issues uh, by providing them trainings in the Amphori Academy, for example, capacity building and further. Now, so that's theoretically, of course, now with the remediation, it really depends on the case. Um, I've seen cases where, you know, business partner is liable. Often cases, it's just the question of implementing new policies and new measures. Um, which is not a financial thing, but if there's a compensation to be paid, it depends on uh, the case itself. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Laura. Uh, then there is a question here for Lara. So uh, here the question is, um, in terms of maximizing efforts to resolve grievances, you mentioned about partnership and coordination among different organizations. In practical terms, how is this collaboration uh, exercised? So at what yeah. level? Can you please give an example? Yeah, um, I mean, I made two examples um, 
where we already collaborate very specifically. So that is the one project um, with Fairware, with the opening of the Fairware mechanism for PST members, but then also um, this collaboration be between Amphori Fairware and us on um, the dealing with complaints from shared factories. Um, so really to look into if there is a severe um, a complaint of severe nature, um, and this can, um, yeah, a benefit from a closer collaboration between different MSIs and different member brands really bring this collaboration um, in. Um, but then also in, more in general with everyone in the carry platform, I think the first step now is that we all sit at the table and really look very critically at our different approaches, um, look what is uh, what has worked good in the past, where maybe some limitations and really look into, okay, um, we have these different um, mechanisms operating in the textile supply chain, other, um, um, other initiatives are working on the topic, um, and where is, the, is there um, um, potential for synergy. So one first step would be to look into um, which factories are covered by these different um, mechanisms, and what does this mean? Is it actually um, necessary for all these mechanisms to be present in one factory? Can we collaborate um, um, in the background rather than displaying it in, in the factory? So this could be a question that we, we address, but also look into um, what, what um, topics do we address? Um, how can maybe the accord um, with its um, OSH focus be complemented through another um, um, uh, mechanism that is looking into wages or can the accord um, be escalated in a way. So we really look into the different um, aspects of each and every mechanism and see how these can complement each other. So it's still a bit in the process and I hope that we will be able to communicate about this um, in the near future, but at the moment it's still very much within our group to, to discuss this in more detail. Yeah, and with regard to the other question, I can quickly um, come to that. Um, I will, or Fair Trade and, um, and us at the PST will communicate about the output of our Pakistan project in the next couple of days. So I would kindly ask you to to check our web page next week so you read a bit more about the project. Perfect. I was going to address that question to you because it had a, uh, was addressed to Laura, but uh, I understand that also your names are very similar, Kengi. Laura, yeah. Laura, yes. Um, there was another question here that's uh, to Laura, uh, and that's um, with regard to the, to the scale up to Bangladesh uh, and India, uh, if there will be a third party uh, uh, on, or ground staff to verify the grievances. So if you can elaborate a bit on how we work there with local partners. Indeed, uh, thanks so much for the question. Uh, so we will, of course, indeed, as in any country, have a pool of uh, local investigation and mediation handlers that will support our members not only in determining the full scope of the issue, what exactly is going on, is there additional risks to be taken account, but also figure out the best remediation form. So for any launch, we have a dedicated um, local support list of investigation handlers and mediation handlers. We also, uh, specifically in India, have a uh, set representation of Amphori in the country. So we have staff in India that help supports not only Speak for Change, but other Amphori services. So we have their insights as well. Now, it's not Amphori who will decide whether a case is grounded or not grounded. We'll just determine whether or not it is within scope. And it's then going to be this local investigation handler who is going to determine whether or not the case is actually grounded or not grounded. So we will have local staff helping us with this, yes. Thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Lara. And thank you so much, Michaela. We are coming to the end here um, of our, uh, well, let's say first part, hopefully, of this webinar series on the German Supply Chain Act, specific obligations under the Act, and the tools that uh, Amphori and the German PST provide uh, to help you implement these obligations. Again, a big thank you to our, to our co-host of the German PST and to the German Help Desk for Business and Human Rights for supporting us uh, in, in this webinar series. I think we had uh, a great deal of questions and interests. Uh, we reached uh, more than 1,000 people in the course of these uh, four webinars, uh, which focused on uh, re the reporting obligations uh, under the German Supply Chain Act, the supply chain knock-on effect, so basically what it means for companies that do not fall within the scope of the German Supply Chain Act, but that are, uh, uh, um, you know, indirectly affected, uh, of course, due to, for instance, increasing requirements from their customers. And then we had another webinar 
uh, that uh, focused on, uh, um, uh, of course, the um, the grievance mechanism. So this one, this one today, and then uh, a previous one also uh, deep diving into our risk analysis uh, tool um, and the risk indicator a tool that will be launched in in July. So stay tuned uh, for that one. Um, and then in the meantime, I would like to make you aware. Uh, also of a couple of upcoming uh, events. Uh, so uh, we have our uh, um, annual conference on the 6th and 7th of November uh, in Berlin. This time uh, it's a 20 year celebration also of uh, BSCI. Uh, so we hope to welcome uh, many of you there. We have a dedicated session again to, to grievance mechanisms, uh, which uh, Laura is organizing. Uh, and of course, uh, the implementation of the grievance mechanism, the scale up uh, in the countries, Turkey being uh, ongoing right now, the onboarding, and then uh, Bangladesh and India uh, to follow soon. Uh, so uh, we hope uh, to, you know, see your support in in the implementation of all these all these steps. You can use uh, all the materials on the academy. You can make use of the offering of the German PST, uh, the publicly available uh, things, and then also of course the one that the member specific. And of course, you can also make use of the German help desk. Um, uh, so please, if you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and on, on that note, I thank you all very much for your great questions, for your participation uh, and for your support. And then going forward, uh, please check our website to see if there is a second uh, a series of, of webinars specifically uh, uh, on aspects uh, of the obligations under the German Supply Chain Act and also looking for, forward uh, under the uh, European Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive, which is coming up next year. So in that sense, uh, yeah, we will keep monitoring this and keep supporting you on this. And thank you all very, very much and goodbye.